All righty. Good afternoon. Welcome to today's Tech Tuesday and Lab Archives. My name is Vanessa, and today we have a few people on who are going to help us learn more about this electronic lab notebook service. Uh, we have Hannah Clark, who's going to be doing a demonstration and talking about lab archives and how you can use it within your own lab. And we also have uh, two people on the Wild Cornell side. We have Drs. Michaela Fortes and Sarah Ben Mamar. They work a lot with our research community and can help you set up your own lab archives and answer any questions you might have about Wild Cornell policies. Just before we get started, I just wanted to let everyone know that I am recording today's session. So if you have questions that come up afterwards or want to share this with your colleagues who may have missed it, I'll be sending you a follow-up email with the recording link, as well as other links that may pertain to today's session that you can use. And if you have any questions at any time during the session, please feel free to put them in the chat. We do have quite a few people who are logging into today's session. So I have everyone muted, but if you want to come off the mic, just raise your hand and I will unmute you so that you can ask your question too. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it off to Hannah. Thank you so much for joining us today. Hi, everyone. My name is Hannah Clark. Uh, I'll be sharing my screen. Um, Feel free to ask questions throughout. I'll stop every so often and, and check chat as well. Um, but I'm a member of the Lab Archives team. And very fortunately at uh, Wild Cornell Medical, uh, you have access to an enterprise license for Lab Archives. And um, some of the folks on the call today are your site administrators. So if we have any local questions or, or policy things like that, I'm sure they'd be happy to, to chat about that. Now, let's start off with the basics. Um, Lab Archives is actually a platform of four different products. We are going to be focusing on today or ELN. You'll often hear the word electronic lab notebook, electronic research notebook, digital research notebook, whatever you want to call it. It's a place to securely store, search, and share laboratory or more broadly research data online. All of our tools are cloud-based. You can access them from anywhere, whether you're on campus, off campus, working from home, or uh, anything like that. We also have inventory and scheduler for other uh, uh, groups and institutions for managing materials as well as equipment. Um, and you may be familiar with our ELN for Education, which is largely used uh, at Cornell University uh, for uh, often like biology or chemistry based courses, often for undergraduate students. Now, let's talk a little bit about Lab Archives. Now, you, as I mentioned, it, we've just described that it's a secure and cloud based system designed to help you with communication. And for me, I think that's really the main point of using an electronic lab notebook. Often labs are still using paper lab notebooks, handwritten notes, printing things off, cutting and pasting, and there's always gonna be some loss of information in that process. So having things like file storage, having attachments, having things like Excel and office documents, notes, observations, um, you know, processes, steps, calibrations, all that sort of thing in one place can help you stay more organized and help your colleagues and supervisors check in, provide feedback and view what's going on within your group. Now, we also have integrations with other tools. Um, so if you are someone who works with things like Snapgene, Graphic Prism, um, PubMed, RedCap, and others, these allow you to send data from those tools into Lab Archives. And it's a great way to kind of tie together your, your full workflow from you know, data collection, planning of experiments, data analysis, and so forth. Um, I won't have a chance to cover too many of these integrations today, uh, but importantly, you can have files of any file type. So if you're on the call today and you might think, gosh, I'm not you know, a, a wet lab scientist or I'm not a you know, biochemist, uh, but if, really it can be data of any file type. We'll be talking about that as well. If you'd like to learn more about some of our integrations, reach out to us. We'd be happy to chat and go into more detail on that, send you some documentation on that as well. Now, in Lab Archives, you can create an account, very importantly, at labarchives.com. Uh, because you all have an enterprise license for Lab Archives, you will log in using your single sign-on, so you'll be able to select any sign-in through your institution button. You'll find Wild Cornell on that drop-down list and log in with your, your Cornell credentials. Now. In the notebook, we have four different roles that we want to cover. First, the highest level role is that of the notebook owner. This is almost always in an academic setting, someone like a PI or supervisor, manager, project lead, whoever is responsible for the data. They can do anything in the notebook, add, edit, share, uh, make changes, adjust settings, and so forth. And often that notebook owner they might be someone like a PI and they may ask you or a colleague or a senior team member to handle more of kind of the day-to-day -day operations within the notebook. 
For that reason, we have the role of administrator. Administrators can do pretty much everything the notebook owner can do, uh, including adding, editing, working in the notebook, and inviting other people. So sometimes that admin might be handling kind of the day-to-day -day operations. Most members of your team will likely have that role of user. A user can add, edit, work in the notebook. They cannot share. They can't invite their friend down the hall. They can just work within that notebook. And the last role here to mention is our guest role. This is often used for interns, volunteers. Maybe you have some undergraduate students who help out within your facility. Uh, they might be given the role of guest. These are for colleagues who might be given temporary edit access, external collaborators, uh, someone who's more of a short-term colleague within the notebooks. So we're going to talk about some examples of how you might set up the notebooks and use these roles. Um, and importantly, everything you've seen here is in a lovely diagram in our knowledge base, uh, covering it in more detail of, of what these folks can and cannot do. Now, we find it really important with researchers to talk about the structure of the data. Now, coming from a paper lab notebook, typically what you would do is have a notebook for each person in your team. So you make a notebook for Hannah. Hannah would have all of her data and projects that Hannah works on. And often in the real world, in, in science, what we find is that the benefit of a collaborative tool and the benefit of collaborative projects is that it's not just Hannah working on this project. It's Hannah and Jill and John and Jenny. And so you have all these people working within a project-based notebook. Within that notebook, you have all of the data for that project, whether that's the SOPs, procedures, clinical trial data, things like that. You might also have notebooks for shared resources. Maybe this is for uh, your protocols. Maybe this is a place for safety information. I know plenty of labs have weekly lab meetings and they'll include those notes in the lab-wide notebooks. And you could also have much more widely shared notebooks for things like policies and resources that could be shared among your whole team. Now, when talking about that, it's important to acknowledge you can have as many notebooks as you need. And often within one group, you might have different teams who work on different projects. Now, someone might be part of two projects, might be part of two different teams. And you can absolutely set up those permissions within the notebook and organize that according to the permissions and roles and rights that your team and your team members have within your data. Now, as just kind of as getting started thing, um, the first person who goes in and sets up those notebooks will be assigned the role of the notebook owner. Now, that is often your PI or project leader or supervisor, but of course, you are welcome to go and set up those notebooks on behalf of that person. You can later transfer ownership. You can decide how you want to set up those notebooks, and you can go in and invite everyone so they can go and uh, access that notebook, add to it, work within there. And if you set up a notebook with higher level permissions, of course, you can also have things like administrators who can then kind of trickle down with those permissions, invite other people, manage the team on your behalf. Now, we often recommend, or especially labs and departments and things like that, for notebooks to be owned by a central person. Usually that's going to be the PI because grad students, postdocs, med students, colleagues eventually move on from their position. And you want to make sure that the all the work, all the data they've added to that particular notebook is maintained. So we'll talk about permissions more in a bit, things like transferring ownership, but I always recommend make sure those notebooks are owned by uh, whoever's responsible for that data. And if you are leaving your position in the same way you would turn in your laptops, your hard drives, your flash drives, your you know floppy disks, if you still have those, um, you would want to hand over your lab archives notebooks as well. We'll talk about that in more detail. Now, if you are brand new to lab archives, really, there's five steps to get up and going with your team. First up, make your account. Go to labarchives.com and sign up using your Wild Cornell credentials. You'll create your notebooks, uh, maybe just be one, maybe several, and You'll talk to your team about the notebook structure. Do you want to create notebooks for each project? Do you want to create a notebook for each person? How do you want the, the folders and subfolders within that notebook to be organized? Then you're going to invite your colleagues. This could be people at Well Cornell, could be people outside of Cornell, and you can go and invite those team members to work within those notebooks. And what we're going to spend a lot of the time today is talking about adding data, adding entries, adding files, adding entries to the notebook, uh, and getting started. Now. If you have any questions today, uh, or really after this session, uh, you are welcome to reach out to our support team directly, which is support at labarchives.com. You also have the excellent team at Weill Cornell that you are always welcome to contact. If you've got policy questions and things like that. Um, they've also offered, they'd love to you know, 
sit down with you one-on-one, -on -one, offer guidance and things like that. Uh, we have our help center, our knowledge base, really a lot of resources to help you get up and going. So don't feel like you have to leave today and know everything you need to know. Don't worry about it. Reach out to us. We're, you know, we're happy to help and chat with your team, sit down one-on-one -on -one and go from there. But I wanted to get into actually kind of showing lab archives, adding an experiment to my notebook, and then talking about sharing and permissions within there. Before I do that, do you all have any questions on anything so far? And as a reminder, you can send a message in chat if you've got questions. And I'll make it bigger to make sure I don't miss anything. All right, I don't see any questions, so we'll keep moving along. When you first log into Lab Archives, you'll come to a page that looks a lot like this. Now, I've actually already set up a notebook with some content for me to work in, and that's what we're going to use today. And you'll see on this left-hand side, my notebook is called Hannah's Notebook 2024, where I have all of the data, projects, things Hannah is working on in 2024. Within a notebook, I have various folders. Now, you can create as many folders as you like and subfolders and have a really complex structure if you want. For me, I have a folder for templates, folder for things that are in progress, folder for completed projects, things that I've already wrapped up. Now, on a particular page, such as this gel here, I can see the information relevant to this page. So on a page, we have various entries. What you see at the top here is what we call a rich text entry. This is going to be notes, observations, text I can put on the page. I have uh, some materials I might have used. And down here, I have some file attachments. You can have attachments of any file type. We have integrations with a lot of different tools that we'll talk about. Um, and you'll see that there are various options for editing and working with these files. There's an excellent question in chat. How long are notebooks kept archived online? Excellent, excellent question. Your Lab Archives notebook has a full audit trail. Everything you add to the Lab notebook has a date and timestamp. This is important because you can prove authorship. You can say exactly what Hannah was doing on March 1st at 1.23 p.m. You can review prior versions of an entry. And probably most important for your question, entries, pages, and folders will never be permanently deleted from the notebook. So once you create a notebook and add some data, it is part of the record of that notebook going forward. Um, so, yeah. Now, let's go ahead and create a new page for today. I'll click the word new. On the left-hand side, you'll see that there are options to create new folders, create new pages, and even to copy information. And copying is where I see folks saving a lot of time. Let's say that I run the same gel day in and day out. I'm going to run the exact same experiment. I might copy this page and then update the new results, update the changes, especially for things like SOPs, procedures, um, or just kind of templates that you build out. Copying can really start saving you a lot of time. In this case, I'm going to create a brand new page. We're going to call this our demo page and click add. On any page or, or thing on the left hand side here, I can right click for options like copying it, moving it, I can drag and drop. You even see an option to delete. But as we mentioned earlier, entries, pages, and folders will not be permanently deleted. So if someone does delete part of the notebook or an entry or a page, it's just moved down here to the deleted items bucket where I can always bring it back into the notebook. I have that full audit trail showing exactly who did the work, when it was done, and, and so forth. At the top here, you'll see that I have actually have several notebooks under my account. Now, some of these are notebooks that I've been invited to. Uh, maybe this is a lab on the hall that I collaborate with. They've invited me to their notebook. I've invited them to my notebooks. I can also make more notebooks at this plus icon. And as I mentioned earlier, some of those first steps, you might go in and create a couple of notebooks for your different colleagues, different projects, different things going on within your team. You can name your notebooks whatever you like. You can select the folder layout. And you can go in and create some folders to help your team get started. And sometimes folks will do that. Maybe you'll start with some folders uh, that match your network drives, your box, OneDrive, whatever storage solutions you currently have. But for today, I want to add entries to my notebook. So on our page, see the very middle here, it says drop files here or create something new. You can also, the word new, and select an entry type. We have a lot of entry types in Lab Archives, and I won't have a chance to cover every single one of them today, but I'm going to show a couple of different entry types. Our most common is this option right here for rich text. This is how I can display notes, observation. I can add a table. I can embed an image. I can embed a video. And 
We're going to have some Nobel Prize winning research this afternoon. This is some text. And I can go in and format this. So I'll make it nice and big. I'll change the coloring and styling if I want to. And when I'm ready, I actually save this to my notebook. I click Save to Page. And my entry is added to the page. Now, with any entry, there are some tools here for editing the entry, moving it around. We'll come back to some of these in another second. And you'll see that date and timestamp is generated. I see a couple of important questions. Uh, when you copy a page, are you able to edit the data in that copied page? Yes. So if you copy a page, it'll give you a whole new copy of those same entries. You can then edit the new version. Uh, and that's very common. Hey, I ran the same experiment from previous, but here's what I changed. Copying is a great way to do that. Um, now, uh, can my OneNote, uh, Microsoft Lab Notebooks, uh, be transferred to Lab Archives? Yes. Um, if you'd like, we can send you a knowledge base article on uh, some guidance on moving from prior uh, products to Lab Archives. Moving from OneNote is pretty straightforward. OneNote has a pretty good export format. Um, they've got like a PDF. They've got a OneNote file format. You could also look into copy and paste as well um, and get that information into Lab Archives. Um, someone is asking me, what are the specific security measures to protect data? Very important. Um, so Lab Archives has uh, matched a lot of security and compliance documentation. And I'm going to go and get you, let's see, I'll, I'll pull this up another tab. Uh, I'll get you our security compliance page, which will cover a lot of detail um, of what we do as a product. Uh, in short, we have been thoroughly reviewed by hundreds of organizations and approved for use. Uh, and uh, including Lyle Cornell, uh, who has approved this for use of uh, various types of data. How is user access control? Can it be customized to different levels of data sensitivity? Yes. Um, so we'll talk about sharing and permissions in the notebook. You can set roles to be whatever you'd like um, and choose to share parts of the notebook, choose not to share parts of the notebook, give read-only access, whatever you like. Um, what is the policy and capability of data recovery in the event of accidental data loss or breach? Um, that will also be answered on that security and compliance page, as well as our trust center is a great place to go in that. Um, in short, <laughs> we are a very compliant product that does our best to ensure that there is no data loss, um, but there is a significant amount of auditing, backup, multiple servers throughout the United States, and things like that to help ensure that um, if a disaster was to occur, uh, that there are always um, things that we can help provide you with. Um, what is the maximum file size that can be saved? Um, this is actually recently up updated for Wild Cornell. Um, and I believe it is 16 gigabytes per file. Let me double check. Yes. So each individual attachment can be up to 16 gigabytes. Um, if someone wants to convert years of paper notebooks into the ELN, would they have to enter all the information by hand? Um, so paper notebooks are always a fun conversion. Um, what I usually recommend is say, hey, this is our data from 2023 or 2015 or you know 2003, whatever it might be. It is archived in this paper lab notebook that we keep on this shelf or we have in this archival storage. If you find yourself going back to something frequently, hey, I use this SOP from 2015 constantly. Maybe it's time to bring that on over. In general, I think looking at a project and saying, I've got to convert, you know, 15 years worth of research into lab archives. That's an overwhelming project and would take you a long time. So I usually say, hey, try not to do that unless you really, really have to. Bring over what you need, leave old projects, leave wrapped up things as is. Um, in terms of converting, I might recommend reaching out to the team at Wild Cornell. Um, there might be some resources available to help you with that. The easiest, you know, <laughs> simple option is a scanner. Scanning in those paper lab notebooks, if you have a scanner or a scanning technology that has what's called optical character recognition or OCR, that will help with that. Um, so that'll help make it a searchable PDF that you could then upload to lab archives or keep in other storage systems. Um, and I, I'll pause if the Well Cornell team has any other advice or suggestions on that. Yeah, thanks, Anna. Um, just wanted to add that there is also the possibility of um, uploading the um, the application on your phone and taking pictures of your um, um, paper notebooks, paper lab notebooks, and um, transfer those um, pictures directly to lab archives. That's also a way to do it a little bit faster than scanning. Yes, absolutely. Um, and that's very common. They will see folks, even, even folks who are actively using lab archives, you know, sometimes at the bench, it's easier to use a handwritten note and things like that. Take a picture, upload that photo to lab archives. That way, even if you lose that 
napkin you were taking scratch notes on. At least it's documented and you can go back and see that. Um, yep. Julie Bevel. All right, I think we're caught up on chat. I will double check. Um, for the person asking a lot of questions about data security, um, that security compliance page will be a good start. If you want even more, like a 40 page document covering all the fun details, um, reach out to our support team, reach out to the uh, site admins here. They'll be happy to give you lots of documentation about what we do uh, because it's lots of fun government compliance. So. Now, on our page, I want to add some additional entries. And let's talk about some attachments here. To add an attachment, click the option attachment and pick some files on your computer. Now, you can have files of any file type. So often people will upload things like images, office documents, things like that to the notebook. But you also might have, you know, unusual proprietary file types that come from various equipment that you use. When you upload these files to Lab Archives, the more metadata and descriptions and text you can add, the better. So having things like good file names where, you know, among our team, I know 8-1-2023, that's the date the sample was collected. J. Doe is the researcher who collected the sample and sample 198 tells me exactly which sample that it is. Well, maybe I also include in the description down here the projects that it's part of, the um, equipment the file was generated on, the work that I'm doing today, or even just quick notes and observations. When I click save, my files will upload. Uh, we will index anything we can recognize as text in our search. So that includes things like file names, file descriptions, the content of certain file types like office documents. Um, and that's a great point for the person talking about converting old paper notebooks. If you've got something with OCR um, or optical character recognition, that will help with search as well. Sometimes with handwriting, it can be tough, especially when you're talking about lots of handwriting where you might take photos and things like that. Um, so having good file names, good descriptions will help you out with search. Now, on any of our entries, there are some tools for working with them. So the pencil icon allows me to edit this entry. And for this Office document, I can do that just pencil icon right here. In this case, it opens up Excel Online. Here, I can make changes to my file. It will update my optical density. As I type into this document, everything I do is saving back to Lab Archives. This supports simultaneous editing. So several people can be working in the same file at the same time. And of course, when I close, all those details come back to the notebook page. Now, if I want to add something in a really specific location, just hover your mouse between. You'll see an insert flag here. So I'll add a heading and say something like final results. I'll click save. Headings just divide up the page a little bit, make it a little more visually interesting. And some groups will kind of label different parts of an experiment, different parts of their work with various headings on the page. And when talking about attachments, often the question is, well, what if I have a lot of attachments? Maybe I have lots of old data uh, that I am trying to convert over to lab archives, or maybe I have equipment that generates files all day long. That's where you may want to check out some of our downloaded tools. These are always available on our downloads page. Up here at the top, you'll see Folder Monitor and the Microsoft Office plugin. Folder Monitor allows you to basically set up a rule. Say I want all these files on my computer to go to this location in lab archives, and it will sit and upload those files all day long. And it's a great way to bring in a lot of attachments very quickly. Our Office plugin allows you to be in the desktop version of Microsoft Office, edit files, make changes, work as you normally do, and save a file directly to Lab Archives from within the desktop version of Office. You don't need to have your browser open at all. You can just work in Office as you normally do, save things back to your notebook, and you have that revision history. Your colleagues get access to that file. Everything goes back to your notebook. Now. For some of the entries on our page, sometimes people will ask, well, hey, what about uh, more standard entries? I want to do some calculations on my page, or I want to uh, have some type of form I want people to complete. And that's where a widget would be helpful. Widgets are a bit of a catch-all. There's a lot of these that are just built into lab archives. Things to add molarity for dilution, um, things to draw a chemical structure if you want to draw a reaction out, and even custom widgets. So this is an example from a group that we worked with. For their group, they used to have these paper sheets everyone was supposed to fill out as they were counting some cells in the microscope. So they're looking at the sample and putting in a sample number. I can type that field in. For a date, I can pick on a drop-down list. We can have checkboxes. I can have required fields. And I can even do some simple math. 
Now, the benefit of something like this, you see, as I type, it's going to do some of this math for me. It's going to reduce the number of kind of napkin math, simple mistakes you might make. And a widget can be used thousands of times across your notebook. So if you design a widget for a certain process or thing that your team does, it's going to standardize your documentation and save you some time. Now, an example like this, with drop-down lists and required fields and calculations might take a bit of time to make. We'd be happy to sit down with your team and offer some guidance on how to do this. Uh, but it can really help save your team a lot of time, set up that consistency and organization with your group. And that will go all back to your notebook. Now, for things like images, I'm going to show very quickly, just annotating on this image, um, we open up our image annotator. This is a fairly simple tool. Now, if you're doing you know, complex microscopy or anything like that, continue using the things you use now. But for a lot of groups, they might take a photo of a glassware setup and they want to highlight you know, what size flask they used. Or they might have a diagram. They really want to quickly circle something, add a label to a gel, and have this all saved back to the notebook. So we'll save my changes. I added my circle. I added my label. When I close, we're going to see the new version of our entry on this page. So we'll be able to review both the original image and the annotations that we made. Now, on this entry, I click the triple dot menu, click View Revisions. I'm going to see the prior version of my entry. So I have the version at 1226 and the version at 1221. I can see what change was made, who made that change. It was me. Uh, what type of change was made, and I have the option to revert to a prior version. That's what I want to do. You know what? I don't. I don't like the annotation Hannah made. We're going to go back to the original. I click revert. I confirm, and now we see the original without the circle, without the label. Maybe this is the wrong image. I didn't mean to even put it in my notebook. Triple dot, delete. This time it's going to take the entry off my page. You don't see it when we're looking at the page. But entries, pages, and folders are never permanently deleted from the notebook. I can always go to page tools, go down to view revisions, and see the prior versions of my entries and pages and work that's been done. So I can see all the way back to adding a page name, adding some attachments, and I can see that at 1227, Hannah, deleted an attachment. I can undelete and bring this right back onto our page. Scroll down, we'll see our images right back here, and the history will still be maintained. I can see exactly what was done, who did those changes, and review the prior versions whenever I need to. Now, we do have a pretty short session today. What I will point out is some features that you can look into later on, including things like links and tags. Links are really helpful if you are referencing data stored externally, whether that is a website, whether that is maybe a procedure or SOP within your notebook, you can link over to that. Tags are a great way to improve the search within your notebook, adding labels and other terms within your notebook. And all of those search tools are up at the top. You can do simple searches or the triangle here, do much more complex search logic. You can do tags, you can do filters, you can search by date and set various filters that you want to look for to find the information later on. We also provide tools for page signing and page witnessing. So if you are an FDA compliant group or if you're applying for some of the new funding that is requiring page signing and witnessing, we do have workflows to support that as well. But I wanna cover uh, you know, sharing your notebook and user management within that. Before I go farther, do you all have any questions on anything so far? Someone's asking, modern Excel use more and more links instead of actual bytes. Is there a special concern that all uploads turn out to be expiral links instead of hard physical data? Um, uh, out of curiosity, do you mean the actual data within the Excel file is more of a link rather than actual storage? Or is your concern about uh, data storage? Tom, I've given you the option to unmute if you want to elaborate on your question. Thanks. I'm just, uh, I'm concerned that often when people go to open an Excel file these days, they will discover that what they're actually doing is invoking a link to a distant file. And so the actual material in the file is not embedded. It's just a reference to some cloud stored version. So 
lab archives is cloud-based. So in the sense that, you know, clicking on this is accessing a file stored in the cloud, it is. Um, if that's a concern, I might recommend um, using some of the local storage that Wild Cornell provides. Uh, but one of the things that we do as a product is ensure that the file here uh, does actually exist, that that link is correct, that connection uh, to the various servers is working. And we do, of course, backend checks to ensure that that will always be the case. Right. Um, so, so, but... so my so my concern is that if somebody has a file that they put up on OneDrive, for example, and that has been uploaded into Lab Archive, and it checks out that it exists, Lab Archive is satisfied and moves on. And then in the future, somebody deletes that file from OneDrive. What does Lab Archive find if you go and reactivate that link? We will always keep the file that is stored within Lab Archives. So it is entirely separate from your personal OneDrive. Whatever happens in OneDrive, that's what happens in OneDrive. If it is in Lab Archives, it will always be maintained here. Now, oh, if you so choose to use our links where you are just putting a URL to a file, in that case, it is just a URL. If that file stored externally has changed, all that we have is the URL. But if the file okay. is actually uploaded to Lab Archives, it is stored on our servers. So Lab Archive takes care of bringing in, uh, you know, so you have a 16 gigabyte file. Lab Archives takes care of retrieving all 16 gigabytes from, say, uh, OneDrive. People don't need to make a local copy of it and then upload their full physical copy of it. So it's not connected to OneDrive. If it's stored in Lab Archives, it is stored in Lab Archives, um, on Lab Archives' of servers. Uh, but yes, we do maintain those those connections. OK, thank you. Yeah. I think, uh, Tom, can I say something? Yeah. Tom, I think uh, I understand what you're saying. It happens to me all the time. Now, somebody puts a file like in Teams or in a message, uh, and then it's, the file is just a link. So I think. Uh, it's better if you, if, so if you open a link in Excel and use, uh, and and then save directly from Excel, that's a very good idea. Because then Excel is actually saving the whole file to, to, uh, to lab archives. Mm -hmm. So that's probably the best way. Or drag it, if you drag it, it's better if you drag it from your local computer. Don't drag a link that somebody else uh, sent you because then then what are you saying can happen yeah I, I would say always be careful whenever you're referencing yeah. data stored in other systems especially if it's you know local file servers things like that um, you'll want to make sure that those urls are maintained um but if it's uploaded to lab archives it is stored on our servers and and subject to all the revision history and audit trail and things like that that we do. And Vanessa, can you unmute uh, Lola? She has a question that I'm not sure what she means though. Oh, sure. Uh, one second. Yeah, and I can read it out. Uh, how long does it take on average to transfer data over to the ELN? Weeks or months? In my experience, you know, people can get up and started with Lab Archives in an afternoon. Now, depending on how much data you're bringing over, if I remember correctly, you're the person with um, some old paper notebooks. That mm -hmm. always depends on the amount of data you're bringing over and, and how 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 you want that to be transferred. Um, and I can get you some documentation on that as well. That'd be great. Thanks. Yeah. Um, and there's someone asking about GraphPad Prism. Yes. So we integrate directly with GraphPad Prism. They're actually one of our sister companies. So we're all owned by a company called Dotmatix. Um, we integrate directly with the desktop version of GraphPad Prism. I've sent a knowledge base link there covering how that works. We'd be happy to show that. We may have a bit of time today. We'll see. Um, but it allows you to basically be in GraphPad Prism and send files directly to Lab Archives and then be in GraphPad Prism and open files from Lab Archives. So you have the full audit trail and uh, ability to work in GraphPad Prism as you normally do. Um, it's a really neat integration. But uh, sorry, Maud, Maud, I think what Maud is asking is uh, if for uh, for Office document, you actually have an online editor. For GraphPad, there is no online editor in Lab Archive. You still have to have to open a GraphPad file, you still have to open, yes, you still have to have a GraphPad on your computer. Yes, so you must have a licensed version of GraphPad in order to edit yeah. GraphPad files. Yeah. 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 All right, so we're all caught up. Um, let's talk about some permissions. Now, in this particular notebook, I am the notebook owner. I'm the PI, I'm the supervisor, I'm the manager, which means I can invite people to the notebook. 
Now, for some groups, I want to share just one entry, one page with someone. And you can do that with the share button. You can right click and select the various share options here. This is how you might give read only access or access to just one portion of a notebook. Most of the time, you're inviting someone you see day to day. They're in your lab beside you at the bench, and you're probably going to give them access to the whole notebook. So you click the triple dot menu, go down to notebook settings. There are lots of settings you can play around with. Feel free to check some of these out. And under user management, I can see who has access to my notebook. So if I have someone new in my team, click new user and type in their email address. If there's someone at Wild Cornell, either Wild Cornell email. In this case, I'm going to invite my friend example at test.com. Type in their email address, click add user, and the person gets an invite to the notebook. They'll get an email invitation. They'll click in, create their account, and they will have access to everything on this left-hand side within this particular notebook. Keep in mind, I have other notebooks in my account. I've not chosen to share those with this person. I might choose to later on. In this case, I only want to share this one notebook. Under the role column here, I can adjust someone's role. So as a reminder, admins can share, users cannot, guests have more restricted rights. If I need page signing or page witnessing as part of FDA 21 CFR Part 11, patent applications or working with a patent attorney, you can adjust those settings. And at any point, you can also remove someone's access. So let's say example has been an excellent member of our team, but they've moved on. They no longer need access to the data. I click the trash can icon, I confirm, and their access is removed. All the work, all the changes, everything they've done in Lab Archives is maintained. The other option here is the transfer of ownership. So let's say I set up notebooks on behalf of my PI. I may later want to transfer ownership to them, or this might be used, hey, I'm leaving my position at Weill Cornell. Someone else is continuing on with the project. I'll transfer ownership to the new project manager, the new person responsible for the data. Well, that has us very close to time. Um, and I know we've had lots of questions, which is always a great thing. Um, I'm always happier to, to kind of chat about lab archives and, and answer questions. Um, what I will mention, some of the things we've not covered are some of our exporting options. We provide both PDF and offline notebook. You can get the data out when you need to various file formats. Um, and of course, we have things like our activity feed, comments, email notifications, where you can draw someone's attention to a particular page or folder. And you can always email someone at support at labarchives.com to get in contact with our team, as well as in any of the, of the tools we have. The eye on the top right is all of our help resources, our knowledge base, quick start guides, and more. Um, now open up for questions, there's already one in chat. So. First one is, um, when a supervisor edits or deletes someone's data, is there a place to explain why they have done this? Um, yes, so if I decide, eh, I don't want this entry anymore, what I would probably want to do is maybe go in and edit and add a little note in here explaining why. It's not something that we require. Anyone who has edit access to the notebook could choose to delete entry, delete a page, delete a folder. But keep in mind, it's never permanently deleted. So if you do wanna add like an annotation, you can do that either editing the rich text entry, maybe add that into the description, just explaining why it's deleted. And then of course, no matter what, you can always go back to that history and undelete it, bring it back if you want to. Um, so even if someone deletes something you don't like, <laughs> you can go back and review that. Um, let me scroll back through chat, see if we're missing any questions. And if not, I wanna thank everyone for coming today. I know it's- uh, There is a question busy. from Mo, sorry. Okay. The um, question, Mo, if you, so is she asking if you make a change in a graph, but you have to re-upload it. If it depends, if you open, if you open the, gra the graph in from lab archives, where then when you save it, it saves it, the changes in lab archives. So that's You have an option in GraphPad Prism where you can save, save this back to lab archives. Yeah. And. If you select that option, it will save the file back to Lab Archives. If you say, yeah. no, I don't want to put this in Lab Archives. I want to keep this local. You can do that. Uh, it's up to you. And actually, you can make, when you, when you save, you can put little notes on what you changed uh, in the file. And that's going to, then notes will also be archived in graph, within graph in Lab Archives. Uh, and while we're waiting, I'm going to get, uh, I've mentioned the, twice the article about migrating old data. So let me go in and see if I can find that while we're chatting. Um, when we transfer to ELA, can we keep the folder structure? Um, 
it always depends on where you're transferring from, but absolutely, you can set up the folders and subfolders however you like. So if you have an existing folder structure that works for your workflows, works for your data structure, absolutely, you can make those exact same folders. Um, if you were bringing over a lot of attachments, a tool like Folder Monitor might be of interest to you because there's an option that's called Map, which will create the same folders that you have on your local drive in Lab Archives. Um, so you'll be able to check out Folder Monitor for that. It looks like there's a question from Anthony that I think got skipped over. When a supervisor edits or deletes someone's data, if the, is there a place to explain why they've done this? Um, yes. So that would be um, either going in and editing that entry and adding a note as to why it might be removed. Or if for things like uh, an attachment, you can go and add that in the description. Keep in mind when that entry paid your folder is deleted, it can always be brought back. So it's never going to be permanently deleted from the note. Um, all right, I know we're not far off time, so I know if you had anything you want to wrap up with uh, for the Wild Cordell team. In the meantime, I'm going to send a link to the article on how to migrate or import data in the lab archives. The people talking about migrating paper notebooks or OneNote, this might be a good starting point. Um, just kind of talking about some considerations to have when migrating to other systems. Um, is there an app version of Lab Archives to directly upload pictures? Um, yes, so we are compatible with all mobile devices. Often people like to use just a browser on that device, Chrome, Firefox, Safari, whatever that may be. Um, we also do have apps for Android and iOS as well. Go ahead, Sarah. It looked like you were um, maybe wanted to add something. Yeah, sorry. I just wanted to, to ask Anna if you could specify if there is any limit uh, regarding um, lab notebook size. Um, I know you have recommendation, I believe, um, for total size for lab notebook. Absolutely. So uh, the main limit, most people, any MF will ever see, is that maximum file limit, which is 16 gigabytes per individual file. In terms of total notebook storage, um, click on your notebook name, you'll actually see how large my notebook is. Um, so you see my notebook's 200 megs. Um, each notebook should be less than one terabyte or less than about 30,000 entries. Um, we sort of joke, we'll send you a t-shirt if you ever get anywhere close. Very, very, very few people ever get anywhere near that because most people have multiple notebooks. And I would definitely encourage you to set up multiple notebooks. It's going to stay more organized that way. I've found that even the people who have you know 10,000 entries in one notebook it starts getting a little hectic and a little confusing. So just separate things out in the different notebooks. It'll stay more organized for your team uh, and go from there. Thanks, Anna. And another question, what is the biggest challenge in migrating to ELNs? I can speak for myself, which is what I typically see, is the change in behavior is the hardest thing because it can be so natural just to, hey, be used to a paper lab notebook and sketching things out and, and just drawing quickly. So moving to a digital system sometimes has some changes in your workflow where you're having to think, oh, rather than having to print this out, I now need to upload this file. And sometimes there can be some pushback from team members where, you, especially in the early days where it can feel like a lot of work, hey, I'm having to type in this thing where I used to just, you know, quickly circle something in my lab notebook or scratch things down. So I think that change in behavior is is the biggest thing. If you have buy-in from leadership, that's the PI, supervisor, manager, that can be great. And I always recommend making a larger conversation with your team about what your process is and set a barrier. Hey, my requirement among my lab is that by Friday afternoon, I want everything you've done that week to be in the lab notebook. That can kind of lower the barrier a little bit where on Monday morning, I can still use my paper notes as long as I type it up by Friday afternoon. Um, so talk with your team is my always, always my biggest <laughs> recommendation because I see a lot of that. Um, sometimes that just uh, change of behavior. Yeah. And we are at time. So are there any other questions or anything else I can help with? Thank you, Hannah, so much. We really appreciate you showing us more about Lab Archives. Michaeli and Sarah, is there anything else you wanted to add before we wrapped up? No. No, nothing on my end. All right, Thank perfect. You. Well, for anybody who signed in late, I have recorded the session. I'll be sending you a follow-up email later today. 
with the link to the recording, as well as some of the resources that Hannah has provided during today's session. And if you have any questions, I'll be sure to list, you know, where you can go for support if you have any questions about Lab Archives. But thank you so much to everybody for joining us and have a great rest of the day.